Anybody remember when just for a brief period, around 1991, 1992, grown men were, you remember? Grown men walking around with pacifiers in their mouths. I'm glad that that season, it didn't last long. It didn't last long. It didn't last long at all. Uh, uh, and I don't have much of a sermon introduction today. I don't. I don't. We're going to get right into the text. Here is really my only introduction. That looked ridiculous. <laughs> Uh, if I preached with this in my mouth, Kevin, you would think, man, I don't know if I need to keep coming back to that church. Uh, it looks crazy for a grown man to do childish stuff. So I'm going to ask you the question when I think about what Rob just read to us. When, when your wish is not God's will, do you act like a baby? Think about it before you answer it. Matter of fact, let your spouse answer it. <laughs> let your children answer it. Let somebody who doesn't fear you answer it. Because we don't want to be the type of church, we don't want to be the type of Christians with the fish on our bumper sticker, but a pacifier in our mouth. It's a bad witness, Judy. <laughs> We don't, we don't want to come here and be praising God and then go to work tomorrow pouting when things don't go our way. Amen? Amen. So, Father, speak. I trust you. I love you. <laughs> so I get out of your way. I beg you to increase. I'm asking you to do it in a way maybe that you've never done it in four years here at the factory. Because we trust you. And I decrease now. Holy Spirit, do what I cannot do. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Now, today is the last week of the Jonah series, and I'll be honest, I'm a little bit sad. I think this is the favorite uh, series that I've ever done for me personally, because I always thought Jonah was about a fish, you know what I mean? A fish swallowing a dude, and it is not. It is about the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign, and if you haven't seen it in the last few weeks, I don't know, maybe I need to do it again. It has blessed me to see how sovereign God is. Uh, when you think about the book of Jonah, Jonah had a problem with God loving everybody. Why did he have a problem with God loving everybody? Because he didn't. He believed in enclave evangelism. He didn't believe in enemy evangelism. I just want people that's kind of like me to get what I got. So you know how God will do. God commissioned him to whom? His enemies. Amen. Better be careful what you don't want if you let God know it. Because Lord knows, Lord knows I ain't want to pastor a church. <laughs> Better be careful. So, so when God commissioned Jonah, Jonah does what any good prophet will do. He ran. <laughs> he ran. He ran the other way. He boarded a ship and went the opposite way way of where he was told to preach. Uh, but you know God, God talked to the clouds, he talked to the thunder, he talked to the rain, he said, go get him. <laughs> and a storm came. Uh, and all that, by the way, Jonah was sleeping during the storm, didn't care. <laughs> and, 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 and his shipmates realized that he was the reason for the storm. So what did they do? Y'all okay? Y'all supposed to talk back to me. Please, come on now. I will be here all day if you don't talk back. They tossed him into the sea where last week we discovered he had a serious problem. It worked last week. I figured I'd say it one more time. But you know God, God is a merciful God. Somebody can testify to that. God sent a big old catfish. Okay, we don't know if it was a catfish, but God sent a huge fish, and the fish swallowed Jonah. It didn't chew him, it just swallowed him. The fish was kind of like a human submarine. The 
then she was kind of like a hotel, motel holiday. And for three days and three nights, it housed Jonah. It housed him. Think about that. He did not die. But he figured after the third day, third night, I probably should pray. It's <laughs> probably what I should do. Once he prays, God causes the fish to get sick. It vomits him out. And then God revisits that thing. Uh, I want you to go preach. Remember I said in chapter one, I still want it. Go preach to Nineveh. Your assignment ain't changed. Now, I sent a fish last time. And that, if I was God, I would have said that. I'm not. <laughs> I get carried away sometimes. <laughs> ah, so he goes to Nineveh, doesn't write a good sermon at all. Five word sermon, nothing about mercy, nothing about grace, nothing about God. Didn't tell him what God did for him. But guess what? The sermon work. I'm a testimony of a dude that can't preach well. God can still use you. He still used Jonah. Still used him. And the whole city of hellions got saved. They repented. They turned from their little G God to the big G God. But Jonah wasn't happy because God's will wasn't his wish. And so in the text, we see two things that happen. We see Jonah's pouting when God's will doesn't equal his wish, and we see Jehovah's patience. Jonah's pouting. He does not get his way. He just preached a doggone revival. The whole city changed. And guess what he should be doing now? He should be leading a Sunday school class. He should be leading a very large, small group. But when we find him in chapter 4, he's hanging out in the nursery. Acting like a baby, pouting, up on CNN and Fox, being a talking head, venting, all up on Facebook. Again, I get carried away. That ain't in the text. <laughs> we see him pouting. But I love chapter four and really the entire book because we see Jonah's pouting, but we see Jehovah's patience. <laughs> Anybody God ever been patient with you? <laughs> so don't you got a reason to lift hands, don't you? <laughs> uh, uh, anybody seen the new Snickers almond commercial? Let's look at it real quick and then we'll come back. You know what I love most about almonds? Everything about almonds. My girlfriend's got almond and so. <laughs> That's enough. All right, let's take up the offering. We're going home. <laughs> Hey, 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 did you see the commercial? In my opinion, now it's just my opinion, the dude that's driving is correct. That's my opinion. Uh, Allman, that's what I believe. Uh, uh, the Allman brother band. It wasn't the Allman brother. Uh, 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 I believe the dude, I believe the driver was correct. I believe the passenger was incorrect. Uh, uh, but, but, but the passenger who's incorrect is talking so crazy that it gets to the guy who's driving, who's in control. You saw it. He jumped out of the car and still with the passenger in it, the car crashes. Now, what would happen if God, who's the driver of your life, jumped out of your life every time you talk crazy? Your life would crash. And I'm glad we don't see that in the book of Jonah. Jonah busy saying, Amen. For four chapters. Um, for four chapters. Amen. Amen. Jew. All day Jew. Four chapters. I'm very serious. For four days. And God keeps on driving. He keeps on driving, even though you're talking crazy, even though you're acting a fool. Anybody can testify, God ain't jumped out of my life every time I mess up. He don't just jump in and out of my life. If he did, our lives would crash. You know what I like about him? 
uh, 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 uh. God won't spoil you when you're acting a child, but he won't leave you either. <laughs> God ain't going to treat you like the little woman in the grocery store, but he won't leave you either. You ever seen that lady in the grocery store with the kids out of control? And she reasoning, and she, yeah, losing her mind, buying them stuff that they don't deserve. When all she got to do, all she got to do, all she got to do. <laughs> I never cried in a grocery store, just for some reason just didn't. My mama had a gift. <laughs> so, so, but it displeased Jonah. It displeased Jonah. Verse 1, it displeased Jonah. What displeased Jonah? The fact that his enemies repent and God relents. You would think he would be happy, but he is not happy. It displeased him and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, ah, Lord. Was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God. I know you slow to anger. I know that you are abundant in love and kindness. I know that you are one who relents from doing harm. Guys, that's a doggone sermon. Verse 2, that's what you should have preached in Nineveh, bruh. Amen. <laughs> Come on. If you just read verse 2, you should get happy. Because God is patient with us. He's slow to anger. He's gracious. He's merciful. Hey, Jonah knows all of these attributes. He just don't want his enemies to know. So guess what he's doing? He rebuking God. Rebuking God. It's, it's a prayer, but it's a rebuke. God, you don't really know how to use your attributes. You ain't a good steward with them. You're giving them to the wrong people. Now, I need mercy. Now, you know, anybody feel like that sometimes? You, you like mercy for you? He's rebuking God. Every time I read this this week, I thought, man, he better be glad I ain't God. You couldn't rebuke me if I'm God. Jonah be walking around like this. <laughs> but Jehovah is patient. He's patient. He's patient. <laughs> he says, therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. For it's better for me to die than to live. What is he really saying? God, hey, over my dead body. Give him grace over my dead body. Give him mercy over my dead body. Hey, 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 I don't want to see them delivered. I would rather die. I'd rather die than see you give grace to the person that abused me. I'd rather die than see you give grace to my boss. I'd rather die. Oh, oh, over, over, my, over my dead body. He's, this is a prayer. <laughs> this is a prayer. <laughs> Ain't no, oh Lord, I bow down. It's none of that. Lord, kill me. Isn't it crazy? Anybody been here all weeks, all the weeks of this series? Isn't it crazy? Remember God commissioned them in verse 2 of chapter 1, the beginning of the book. Go preach, boy. Go to Nineveh and preach, right? Shouldn't he been praying then? You would think he would have prayed then. Hey, God, guide my mouth. Guide my tongue. Give me a word. He didn't pray then. You remember when he was on a ship in his surda, in his water bed down at the bottom, and the storm was going on? He didn't pray then. You remember when a fish swallowed him up? It took him three days and three nights to pray, but his enemies get delivered. He praying now. He that mad. And hate something else. Hate will make you pray a jacked up prayer. Rebuking Jehovah. Hate. Prejudice. <laughs> Can I get you to do me a favor? Uh, Y'all are pretty quiet. Every, we cool? Okay. <laughs> I 
analyze your prayer life. I gave this homework assignment a few weeks ago. Analyze it. I dare you to, to really be honest. Analyze your prayer life and answer these questions. Now, when do I tend to pray? <laughs> uh, 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 what makes me pray? And, 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 and do I tend to pray a power? Do I use God as just like a genie? Come on now, God. Come on now, God. Hook me up again. I ain't thank you for the last time, but go on, God. Hook me up. How do you analyze your prayer life? Because, oh boy, the prophet Jonah, his prayer was jacked up. I, 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 when I wrote this down in my notes, man, I felt a little bit convicted. Sometimes I tend to pray when I need something. I don't sometimes just pray because he good. That's me. I got to get better myself. Look at your prayer life because when you look at Jonas, we can see how whacked out he is. But what about ourselves? You use prayer to get what you want. Do you use prayer to get what you want because you're a baby? I'll be done with this next week. Next week will be a fun week. I guarantee it. <laughs> then the Lord said, then the Lord said, hey, hey, is it right for you to be angry? What did Jonah just say? Hey, kill me. He lucky I'm not God because verse four would have read differently. You really want to die? You really want to die? Fish, come, come, come finish him up. But God said, God said, is it, is it right for you to be angry? <laughs> that's a question, isn't it? Uh, if you, that's verse 4. If you go to verse 9, we see another question. Is it right for you to be angry again about this plant? Question number 2. If you go to verse 11, another question. Hey, hey, is it, should I not pity Nineveh? It's three questions. And, and here's what I've taught you all before. When God asks questions, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. God is trying to talk to you. He's trying to tell you something. He's trying to get you, here it is, to use this right here as a mirror. He's trying to get you to see yourself. God knows the answers, but God is reasoning with Jonah. God patiently reasons with him. And the one thing I've learned from God, from reading this book, God has all the power. He can speak to the rain, to the clouds. He can speak. He's got all the power. So we can learn from God. When, when, when you have all the power, be patient even when you have the power. When you're dealing with an adult that's acting like a kid, be patient even when you got the power. Parents, even when you got the power in your house, be patient with your kids. Sometimes I'm not patient with my son. He and I were riding in this morning. He's in the car with me at 7 o'clock. Shouldn't I be happy? 7 o'clock in the morning, and I reminded him of a story. One time, a huge storm came up. He was about 5 or 6. He remembered it. He was about 5 or 6 years old. I mean, a huge storm came up, Greg. It was howling. The wind was blowing. I said, hey, son and daughter, let's go downstairs, turn all the power off, and let's watch the storm. We open up the blinds. We open the blinds and watch the storm. I had just seen the movie The Soloist, Jamie Foxx and Robert Downey Jr., and the homeless people were on my heart. I wanted my kids to see that we have a roof over our head when it's hailing outside. I wanted them to be grateful. He's five or six years old. I wanted him to get his praise on. I wanted him to start speaking in tongues because we got a roof over our head and we got a bed to sleep on. He's five or six. He ain't get it. I got so mad at him, I threatened to take him outside in the hell. What's my point? I got all the power in the house, but I'm not patient. He was five or six. He don't care about no roof over his head. <laughs> I'm wanting him to be a theologian and get deep. When you have the power, do like what God did. Don't look for an argument. Look to reason with people. Don't go on CNN and Fox being a talking head who debate everything. What if, what if the Christians who go on those channels just ask some soft questions? Don't go on Facebook trying to... Trying, God is reasoning with the spoiled, bigoted baby. 
Can, 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 can we not do the same? Are we going to keep trying to win? Hey Amen. Keith, Keith, man, you're amazing, brother. When you preach. <laughs> Remember David? One time he encouraged himself. <laughs> so Jonah... So, so Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. Is that not verse 5? Is that verse 5? Is that verse 5, y'all? Jonah goes on the east side of the city and sits in the gate of the city. He's looking. The east side of the, that's verse 5, right? Verse 4 is God asking him a question. Am I not lying? Verse 4, God is asking him a question. Verse 5, Jonah goes out of the city and sits on the east side of the city. Verse 4, though, God asked him a question. Is it right for you to be angry? Why are you tripping, bro? Verse 4, a question. Verse 5, Jonah goes out of the city, sits on the east side of the city. What's my point? Only point I'm trying to make is Jonah very disrespectful. He don't even answer Jehovah's question. God, if I ask you a question, give me some courtesy. Jonah doesn't even have courtesy. He pounding. He bounces. He leaves. That seems to be a tendency of his because that's what grown babies do. You preach a sermon they don't like, they bounce. You tell them the truth, they bounce. Responsibility comes, they bounce. He does not even answer God's question. Disrespect. Can I, did I say this already? Better be glad I'm not God. I wonder how would a switch from God feel if he whip you with a switch? God. Y'all know what a switch is? Where am I? He, he, he goes outside of the city. He sits on the east side of the city. And what does he do? He made himself a shelter and sat under it in what? In the shade. <laughs> Hold on now. He living in rebellion, chilling out in the shade. In rebellion. <laughs> you rebelling. But got the audacity to be chilling up in the shade in the east side of the city, looking, hoping to see destruction. Got a good view of the city, but you can't see yourself. <laughs> you can see the city, and you hoping God will bomb it, but you can't see yourself. Got a good view. Isn't that how prejudice works? Isn't that how hate works? You have a false perception of other people, but you also have a false perception of yourself. Prejudice, prejudice makes wrong feel right and ridiculousness seem rational. Prejudice will do that. Prejudice will make it seem right for one group of people to drink out of this water fountain and another group of people to drink out of that water fountain. It, that just felt right to even church people back then. Think about that. The church was around during that time. Uh, prejudice, man, y'all are quiet. Prejudice will make it feel right for one group of people to sit at the front of a bus and the other group of people to sit at the back. The church was around during that time and, and they were under the shade, chilling out in the shade. Jonah built a shelter in the shade. <laughs> Y'all hear me? He getting comfortable. Isn't it bad when you can be in sin and be comfortable? <laughs> so this week when I saw that I asked God something I said God my prayer is going to be use me to teach in a way that people cannot make shelters amidst their sin yeah 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 I don't care if people don't like me use me to preach the truth I don't, I don't care if I don't get a lot of amens. I don't want people coming here comfortable in their sin. I don't want to beat you up if you're living in sin, but I do want you to repent. I do want you at a certain point to say, you know what? I'm turning from my sin. I don't want to preach in a way where everybody just happy every week. You shouldn't be happy if you're living apart from God. You shouldn't be happy sitting at the east side of the gate, wanting people to go to hell, and you're the one that's messed up. Hey, where in the world were the truth-telling pastors during slavery? Where were they? Yeah, 
Where were the truth-telling pastors doing Jim Crow and separate but equal? Where were they? Man, I cannot be that pastor. It's comfortable. He's, he's sitting in the shade. Comfortable. It's like mega churches today. They build mega churches, many of them, not all of them, based on demographics. They do demographic study and then they build a church that everybody can be comfortable because everybody's alike. I know what I'm talking about. I've read the church planning books. That's wrong. It's wrong. Guess what? If I had done that, I read seven church planning books, loved them until I got to the demographics chapter. Because I was like, hold on. If I do this, then I can only have black people around my same age, all of them good looking. <laughs> if it's about demographics, I can't have ugly people at the church. <laughs> and I'm kind of joking. But it saddens me that that's what we've made church. Bump demographics. We need to go to Nineveh. You can't have it made in the shade living in sin here. Lord, don't ever let me punk out. Don't ever let me punk out. Thank you for clapping, Brandy. Your reward is in heaven. <laughs> I hate when you're not here. Look at verse 6. And the Lord God prepared a plan. I would underline the Lord God prepared a plan. If you write in your Bible, I would underline that. The Lord God prepared a plan, made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. Hold on now. But I thought Jonah had already built his own shelter. But God is hooking him up anyway. Uh, 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 his shelter didn't really work. Here's what I know about Jonah. He just went there to preach a quick sermon. I just don't believe he brought his tool belt to build a shelter. I don't think he brought his uh, general contractor uh, thinking I'm going to build a shelter. I don't think he brought grip pliers, screws, hammers, and nails thinking I'm going to build a shelter. So here's what I know. His shelter couldn't have been all that good couldn't have been. Had to be flimsy. It reminds me of a few weeks ago when my wife and I were in Jordan. Uh, as soon as we crossed the border, we did Mount Nebo. And then from Mount Nebo, we drove for hours and hours. As we're driving, we can see Syrian refugees who had built their own shelters made out of old sheets and any type of old cloth. They're living in that. They're living in that. Somebody say, those, those shelters were a mess. So the shelter Jonah built on the east side of the city, man, it wasn't no mansion. It was a mess. So what does God do? God builds a shelter to cover him. In other words, God's mercy covers Jonah's mess. <laughs> Can I say that one more time? God's mercy. Jonah built something thinking it would work out. You know how we've done, right? We thought it would work out. We built a relationship with him or her. It didn't work, but God covered you anyway. That's, that's called mercy. So, so maybe, maybe since you didn't respond the way I was hoping, maybe let me take Jonah's name out. You built something that was a mess, but God covered you with his mercy anyway. <laughs> You were in college, you fell in love, you got pregnant, you had an abortion, but God's mercy covered you anyway, and nobody even know. He, you sitting up in here now, nobody even know, and God still love you. God's mercy covered your mess. Uh, 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 you, you, you fill with anger. You fill with anger. Man, you, are, you have been violent in your past. You've made a mess of some things, but God's mercy covered you anyway. Immoral. But God's mercy covered you. Can three people in here testify? God's mercy has covered my mess. Hey, just do me a favor and just look around real quick. Just look around at the people in the room. You know how much sin is in this room? But we covered. <laughs> uh, so Jonah was very grateful for the plant. He gets religion finally. He's grateful for a plant. 
But as morning dawned the next day, I would underline this, God prepared a worm. So in verse 6, God prepared a plant. In verse 7, God prepared a worm. And it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose. Here it is again. I'd underline this. God prepared a vehement east wind. So God prepares a plant. God prepares a worm. God prepares whatever vehement is. He prepares it. And the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Look at Jonah. Then he wished death for himself and said, it is better for me to die than live. Jonah always want to die. Like, remember when he was on the ship? Just throw me over. That's your answer? Kill me. <laughs> Twice he said to God, just, just kill me. And I don't think he means it. I think he just, I just think, I just think he a baby. He's just a baby. When you're a baby, you say some crazy stuff. When I was little, um, uh, my mama had a gift of spanking. We didn't call it spanking because she didn't really spank because she whooped us. Big difference. Spanking don't hurt. Man, you spank somebody with pants on, what does that do? My mama whooped us. Sorry. And she'd be under the jail today. Sometimes she whooped us so much, I wanted to die. Just, I just yeah, I want to die. <laughs> like, like Jonah. I remember we didn't grow up with money. And so there were times mama would whoop us and then she'd make us sit on the back porch. I don't know the logic, but we'd, we'd sit on the back porch and we'd compare our marks. <laughs> See who got it the worst. And, and, and then we'd be crying and saying crazy stuff. I just wish I was dead. Or I wish she was dead. I wish God would kill. I just want to run away. That's what Jonah's doing. Just kill me. Brother, you could have died if you really wanted to die. Remember that fish had you? <laughs> Jonah... Whenever he experienced discomfort, he, he handled it with depression. He, he want, I, I just choose depression rather than deliverance. I, I, I know I'm talking to some people. I'm going to just st take my time because I've dealt with depression myself, so I'm not here to judge you. I, I, anytime discomfort comes in your life, you know when the bills just get a little bit too much, do you just choose depression? What if you chose deliverance? God, deliver me from worrying about my name. Amen. God, deliver me. I don't choose depression. Somebody in the room ought to say with me, I don't want to die. I want to be delivered. Hey, not only do I want to be delivered, I want to be developed. Develop me. Don't kill me. Develop me. God, I don't want to quit. Develop me. God, I don't want to give up. Develop me. God, I don't want to take a shortcut. Develop me. God, I don't want to cheat the process. Develop me. Hey, if we're going to do what this sermon series has urged us to do, God's going to have to develop a lot of us. We cannot choose the easy way out. Uh, Jonah's like, kill me. But then God said to Jonah, I I is it right for you to be angry about this plant? Listen to Jonah, though. He said, it is right. <laughs> no, I like Jonah. <laughs> no, I'm like, yeah, I'm right. <laughs> You know anybody like that? They wrong as can be. He's sitting under his raggedy shelter, got a sunburn on his head. I'm like, yeah, I'm right. <laughs> TV don't work. Can't pay his bills. He said, he said, yeah, yeah, I'm right. It's right. It's right for me to be angry, even to death. Kill me. <laughs> Did I say this already? Be glad I'm not God. I said this already, but prejudice makes wrong feel right. It makes ridiculousness seem, seem rational. But the Lord said, you've had pity on the plant for which you've not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh? That great city. Don't you just love God? He refers to Nineveh almost every time you say, that great city. Now, and now to, now to the average Jewish person, it was just a hellhole. God don't see things the way we see it. 
That's another sermon. <laughs> that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock. What is God really doing? He's saying he went Allen Iverson on Jonah. He said, you sitting up here talking about a plant? You talking about a plant. That what you sitting up in? You talking about a plan? You ain't talking about the people. You talking about a plan? You 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 sitting up in there talking about a plan? That what you talking about? A plan? You ain't talking about the men and women that got saved, but you talking about a plan? Not the game, but a plan. You ain't talking about the little boys and little girls who changed. No, no, you talking about a plan. You ain't talking about the little sheep and the cows who are going to get to live now because of my grace. You, we sitting up in here talking about a plan. Reminds me of a lot of the conversations I see Christians on Facebook. We sitting up in there talking about that. That's what we talking about. When we could be talking about God, you could be posting a verse. We sitting up in there talking about politics again? <laughs> How many years have we had this political system? Haven't you learned by now? Trust in God. Stop trusting in man. We sitting up in there talking about politics. <laughs> we sitting up in here talking about racism. We, we sitting, we sitting, we, die to yourself. What is God really doing? What is he really doing? He's really telling Jonah in verses 10 and 11, hey, uh, you have distorted affections. Your affections are distorted. Uh, uh, you're dist uh, you got distorted affections. Bruh, you having a one night stand with a plan. That's distorted affection. That plan ain't got no heart. You realize that, right? It don't have a soul. You got distorted affections. Uh, you sitting up in here having distorted affections. You having one night stands with political candidates. Man, you putting they signs in your yard. You ain't never put a scripture out there. You ain't never shared the faith with that neighbor. You got distorted affections. Y'all okay? Everybody loves me. I love y'all. <laughs> You got distorted affections. Uh, you only love the plant, Jonah, because of your own self-interest. Y'all, most of us only love the political candidates we love because they hook us up. Uh, we vote for them based on what they'll do for who? Me. Wonder why we're in such a mess as a country? You know what it says? It says more, not so much about President Obama, not so much about President Trump. It says a lot about us. We got a bunch of Jonas. We can't be Jonah. We cannot take your pacifier and stomp it and crush it. You hear me? Hmm. Racially, what, 400 plus years of Jonahism? That what pastors here are doing all of the crap that's going on. They're pastors here. You know that David Platt uh, this week? Preached. Y'all know David Platt? He's amazing. He preached to 1,200 pastors on racism. Do you know he got destroyed on social media? Why is that? Because even pastors, they don't want to talk about certain things. They don't want to repent of certain things. They want to live in their comfortable shelters and preach a quick 15-minute sermon, take up that big offering, and get another car every three or four years. Golly, it's quiet. <laughs> we got distorted affections. Some of it is the preacher man's fault. What has your heart? What has your heart? What really has your heart? What has your passion? For real. So we went through this series. We're done today. What did you get out of it? For you. God is really saying, stop having distorted affections and start having divine affections. Man, you worried about a plant that you knew for 24 hours? I made that plant. I'm the gardener. 
<laughs> you, the way you feel about that plant, I feel that way 10 times more about Nineveh. They mean the world to me. You might not like them. I feel that way about the Middle East. I feel that way about, about gay people. I feel that way about the racist. I feel that way about the gangster rapper. I, I even like Taylor Swift. <laughs> you know that's a good God. <laughs> Do you care for your own comfort more than for the earthly and eternal destinies of others? I've asked that question three or four times in four years. Hey, here's the prayer that I want us to pray for homework. Pray this prayer. God, give me divine affections. I want divine affections. I want to put people over a flag. Give me divine affections. I want to put souls over even the Constitution. I want to put souls over my skin color. I want to put divine things even over my culture. I want you. Give me. Hey, give me your heart. I want your heart. You notice what I noticed in chapter four? It's dialogue throughout the entire chapter. You got a divine God talking with a dysfunctional prophet. It's dialogue. Jonah is pouting uh -uh, while God is being patient. It's happening simultaneously. You notice that? It's not like Jonah is pouting behind God's back. <laughs> He's doing it while God is being patient. Jonah is tripping and God is trying. That's what you see throughout the whole text. He's acting like a baby, but God is trying. That's all of our testimonies. When we trip, God tries. He pursues us. There are 15 people in here can say, I've acted like a baby, but God still pursues me. I've acted like a little kid, but God still pursues me. I've been consumed with anger, but God still pursues me. I've been immoral, but God still pursues me. And it happens. God allows me to talk to him and walk with him and have a relationship with him in spite of my baby ways. What I love about God, he, 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 he won't be an absentee father even when his kids are annoying. Jonah spends a whole chapter having a childish conversation with God. Hey, Anybody ever had a childish conversation with God other than me? Even about the church a few years ago, we had some childish conversations because this didn't make sense to me. Hey, anybody ever had a childish conversation with them? Hey, uh, uh, here's what I dare you to do. I dare you to have a childish conversation with your boss two or three times. See, see, see. See what happens. Go in there and rebuke your boss tomorrow. And then do it again next week. And then you ain't got to worry about the week after. <laughs> do you not see how good God is? Coming to an end, but I, I noticed this as I was done with my notes. Relationship and control are not synonymous. We got some dysfunctional people that think they are. Relationship and control are not synonymous. I remember when I was in high school, I had a job, and a lady who was old enough to be my mom, every Sunday morning, she'd come in bragging about her. Her boyfriend had beat her up. She would brag about it. She, she thinks relationship and control are synonymous. She thinks that means he loves me. Relationship and control aren't synonymous. One of them allows for a rebellion. Relationship allows for a rebellion. My kids, both of them, have rebelled before, but they still got a bed to sleep in. They still got a car that they get to drive in. They still eat three meals a day plus snacks. <laughs> control, control doesn't allow rebellion. Remember when I told you to underline verse 6, verse 7, and verse 8? The plant was never given an option to rebel. 
God is asking Jonah questions. He don't ask the plant no questions. Plant, you just got to do what I say. You remember verse, verse, verse 7, the worm? The worm doesn't have an option to rebel. Humans do. God doesn't ask him, hey, is it right for you to eat the plant? He doesn't ask that worm any questions because he's controlling the worm. He made the worm. You remember in verse 8, the vehement east wind? It doesn't have any options. It can't rebel. Remember in chapter 1, that storm don't have any options. You got to do what God says. Remember the fish? The fish were like, mm -hmm. no, we got to do what God says. In a relationship, you have the option to rebel. You got an option for four chapters to act like a baby, and Jehovah is still patient. You wonder why I lift him up? Because it's just four chapters. I've had 48 years worth of baby ways. <laughs> God could control the wind in chapter one. He could control the worm and the plant. He could control the fish. He could control the vehement east wind in chapter four, but he could not control Jonah unless Jonah submitted. God doesn't want servitude. He wants submission. God ain't gonna punch you in the eye to show you he love you. He's going to let you do what you want to do, and he'll be there. Here's what I love about God from chapter 4. God would rather have a conversation with us than control over us. He wants relationships and not robots. <laughs> so let me give you some takeaways. First takeaway, prejudice. How does it affect you when it comes to ministry? Don't answer that question too quickly. Don't say, well, I don't have prejudice. See, we when we hear that word, we think of the KKK and all of that stuff. No, what's your prejudice? It might not be a skin color thing, but, but, but what's your prejudice? Who are the people that you're biased against? And how does that affect you in ministry? Number two, what do you do with your privilege? What do you do with your privilege? What do you do with your privilege? I see privilege throughout this book. Uh, 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 the sea doesn't have a privilege that Jonah has. The fish doesn't have a privilege. Jonah has some privileges. The privilege that he has, I get to talk to God. I don't have to be a robot. That's a privilege. What do you do with your privilege? Mankind is privilege. We got a privilege that the rocks don't have. What do you do with it? In this country, sometimes skin color means privilege. Let's just be real. What do you do with it? In this country, oftentimes gender means privilege. Typically, a man is going to make more than a woman. And one thing I know is we ain't smarter than them. But we're privileged. Man, as an American, if you live in this country, I've been to some other countries, we are privileged. You don't like your job, go to Tanzania and see men plowing behind a gold in the hot sun, making just a few cents. We're privileged. So factory, what are we going to do with our privilege? One of the things we're going to do, we're going to keep digging wells. We're going to keep feeding orphans. We're going to keep sharing the gospel. What do you do with your privilege? Stop pouting, you privileged. You alive today. And then finally, don't let your meology govern your theology. Don't let your feelings govern your theology. Don't let your feelings dictate if you're going to really follow God. I know too many Christians like that. When it's good, they own. When it's bad, they're not. Jonah runs from God. Don't let your feelings dictate it. Is your truth more important than the truth? Did y'all read verse 11? Uh, verse 11. Should I not pity Nineveh? Should I not pity Nineveh? Shouldn't there have been at least one more chapter after that question? The book is. It's over. We don't know what Jonah said, do we? The 
question is unanswered makes me uncomfortable. Here's what I told God. The factory, though, we got to answer that question. What's our Nineveh? Who's our Nineveh? Who are the people we hate? We got to answer the question. Isn't it right that God can save them too? Is it? Do you want God to save the person that abused your prayer team? Come on up. Some of you have been abused in here. And I ain't trying to be insensitive. I know you got to be struggling with God having mercy on the person that abused you. Anybody in here ever been lied on before? And now Keith is telling you that you got to love them? Really, Keith ain't the word is. We got to answer some questions, don't we? Will you love your enemy? Will you evangelize your enemy? Will you love your boss? Will you love your employee? Will you love that Republican? Will you love that Democrat? Will you? Will you love that crazy neighbor? And if you don't have one, you the neighbor. Here's what I want us to do, because I don't want us to finish this sermon series and not practice what we've read. I'm telling you, we got to die to do this. We have to die to do this. As we get ready for prayer, if you got some people that you struggle to like, we did it last week, I want you to come up here and get prayer. If you can think of a specific person you don't want to forgive, you don't want to let the past go. It doesn't make sense for you to love somebody that abused you. It doesn't make sense for you to trust God to minister to them. Would you simply come up and give prayer? Please come. I don't want to beg you. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul.